Well, good afternoon and welcome to uh, uh, Institute for Global Health Sciences at Grand Rounds. It's a pleasure to have today highlights from the malaria uh, elimination initiative, uh, which we've been on, which we've been working for the last um, 14 years. I'm George Rutherford. I'm the acting executive director, um, and I'd like to introduce our two speakers uh, and discussant. Um, so just to say that um, we've worked alongside uh, malaria endemic countries and regions to advance malaria policy and practice through research, advocacy, and technical assistance. Um, and MEI has on malaria elimination initiative, MEI, has ongoing activities in more than 20 countries uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia Pacific, and Latin America. And in this ground rounds, we'll provide an overview of our current work, of their current work and where we're headed. Alison Tatarski will speak first as director of the Malaria Elimination Initiative. Uh, she has more than 12 years experience working alongside and in service of ministries of health on malaria elimination strategy, policy, program implementation, and operational research. Um, during her tenure at, at, uh, at MEI, Allison's established the vector control and surveillance portfolios near and dear to my heart, um, and including research on uh, innovative vector control tools and entomologic surveillance strengthening, uh, entomologic surveillance strengthening through TA capacity building and decision tool development. As a member of MEI's uh, leadership team, Allison has worked to expand um, uh, uh, partnerships and shape MEI's strategy, including MEI's uh, approach to targeting and tailoring of, a mal of malaria elimination uh, approaches, uh, including subnational level program problem solving and impact. Our second speaker will be Dr. Michelle Sang, is a pediatric infectious disease physician and malaria epidemiologist. She serves as the director of research for the Malaria Elimination Initiative um, and is associate professor uh, of epidemiology and biostatistics in the famous division of infectious disease and global epidemiology with a secondary appointment in pediatrics in the division of pediatric infectious disease. She's also a Chan Zuckerberg Biohub investigator. Um, she uh, uh, since it's big game week coming up next week, I will note she studied human biology as an undergraduate at Stanford and attended medical school at Baylor. She trained in PEDS and PEDS ID at UCSF and obtained a master, uh, an MSc in epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. From 2012 to 2021, she was assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School, where she was also a Horchow Family Endowed Scholar in Pediatrics and from which we successfully recruited her back. And then last but not least, uh, Lake uh, Bougre is currently an IGHS master's student and he will moderate uh, the Q&A following the presentation. Thank you all very much. Um, uh, so um, Allison, if you could take it away, please. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I should also mention that IGHS is currently accepting applicants to the Global Master of Science to the Master of Science in Global Health uh, program. Um, and we'll be accepting those for the next, uh, I'm not sure how long, but for several weeks at least. And then also um, for those of you who are feeling, uh, next slide please. For those of you feeling guilty about getting a booster dose, um, Professor Sarah McFarlane, who's an emerita professor in our department is spearheading with others, a get one, give one worldwide campaign. Um, which asks for a $7 donation to COVAX every time you get a vaccine, um, get a booster dose, uh, and this is the QR code for it, and the URL is getonegiveoneworldwide.org, um, and that's up on the IGHS website as well. So let me turn it over to Allison, and thank you all very much for, uh, for attending. Great. Thanks so much, George, for the introductions. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Thanks for the opportunity to present to you a bit about malaria and about the Malaria Elimination Initiative here at IGHS and UCSF. Um, so I will get started and then um, I'll hand, we'll hand back and forth with my colleague, uh, Michelle, as we go through our slides. And then we'll have time at the end for Q&A with, uh, with Blake and look forward to your questions um, as we go. So first, uh, a brief history of malaria to contextualize our work. So malaria has been around for millennia. Uh, Hippocrates actually described a malaria-like disease in medical text dating back to the fourth or fifth century BC. 
And in a postmortem of King Tut, uh, scientists found DNA evidence of Plasmodium falciparum from his death in uh, 1324 BC. And Alexander the Great may have died of malaria infection in June uh, 323 BC. <laughs> Uh, so fast forward to 19, uh, to 1718, uh, that's when the term malaria was uh, coined by Italian physicians. Malaria means bad air in, in Italian, uh, stemming from the belief that uh, malaria came from uh, swamp air. Finally, in 1880, French surgeon Alphonse Laverin discovered the malaria parasite, and in 1897, Ronald Ross discovered the malaria parasite in the gastrointestinal tract of a mosquito, proving that malaria was in fact transmitted by mosquitoes. So, um, malaria. The U.S. was actually a malaria endemic uh, for 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 centuries. In 1882, you see the endemicity of malaria across the U.S., mostly in uh, sort of central and southeast U.S. And over subsequent decades, a malaria burden declined largely due to development and urbanization. In 1955, the World Health Organization launched the Global Malaria Eradication Program to attempt to eradicate malaria from the world. Um, and 16 countries successfully eliminated malaria during this time, and several other countries significantly reduced their transmission, but most of this was in the global north. Um, and there were failures across sub-Saharan Africa and much of the developing world to, to make any progress toward that goal. And so in um, in 1969, through a World Health Assembly resolution, eradication of malaria was actually abandoned. Fast forward to 2007, when uh, Bill and Melinda Gates and our very own Sir Richard Feacham put uh, malaria elimination back on the map and challenged the world to once again consider uh, elimination goals at country and regional levels. And to 2019, when UCSF, acting as the Secretariat for the Lancet Commission on Malaria Eradication, put forward, alongside other groups, the, uh, the idea and the goal of malaria eradication once again. Uh, and we, uh, the Commission put together the first comprehensive peer-reviewed academic study to examine the requirements to achieve a world free of malaria within a generation. And the Commission report really puts forward the evidence and roadmap for eradication in our lifetime. Um, looking at several components, including software for malaria eradication, so looking at things like management and data for decision making, the hardware requirements for eradication, including research and development and innovative tools, and financing for malaria eradication, what it will take both from donors and uh, endemic country governments to finance uh, eradication globally, and all rooted in the requirements around leadership and accountability at all levels uh, to reach the eradication goal. So key messages stemming from the Lancet Commission report include that malaria can and should be eradicated by 2050, that eradication is affordable, eradication is a good investment, and the alternative to eradication is untenable. So that's the brief history. I don't know if I made it in 90 seconds, but uh, now I'll turn it over to, uh, to Michelle to talk about the love story between a uh, parasite and vector. Thanks, Allison. Um, so malaria transmission occurs from, um, uh, sorry, malaria occurs from the transmission of the plasmodium parasite from humans to other humans through the bite of the Anopheles mosquito. Um, can you press next, Allison? And again, yeah. So this is an illustration of plasmodium infected red cells. And of the four, to the top four, these are human only species. They um, the top two, falciparum and vivax, cause a larger burden of disease. With falciparum mainly responsible for most of the deaths. Um, Nolzai is the, is the only one which was recently discovered to be transmitted from monkeys to humans. And of the mosquitoes, there's more than 460 species, about 30 to 40 commonly transmit human malaria. This is a photo of Anopheles gambia complex, and it's best known just because it's um, so efficient at transmitting falciparum. And what makes malaria interesting and challenging is that these different parasites and different mosquitoes behave differently across different geographies. So there isn't a one size fits, fits all approach to patient care or um, public health. Next slide, please. Um, so just, uh, I thought it'd be useful to go through the life cycle just because it informs how we diagnose, treat and prevent malaria. So when taking a blood meal, um, the infected Anopheles mosquito injects the sporozoites which then travel to the liver and replicate. And then there's a, a week to one month incubation period in the liver. Um, 
after which merozoites are released and then they invade red cells, which replicate and then cause red cell rupture. Um, and then those uh, merozoites invade more red cells. So you get this cyclical pattern, uh, which contributes to the anemia and the fever that you get. And this is um, uh, how malaria is traditionally diagnosed by looking at a blood smear to look for parasites. And then for transmission to occur, the mosquito needs to take up these sexual forms, the um, gametocytes. Fertilization happens in the um, gut of the mosquito and then the sporozoites make their way up to the salivary glands and then the mosquito injects the next person. And then there is another strain, vi uh, Vivax and Ovalley are two for which they have um, some dormant stages in the liver and you need a, a different drug to prevent relapses uh, with that strain. Next slide. So um, how we um, diagnose and treat malaria and detect it, um, well, on the very top, you know, as with most febrile illnesses, someone will present to a health facility for care to get diagnosed, treated, and for the case to be reported. Um, but more and more, you know, there's a detection happening through the community health workers. So in the second schematic on the right, um, you know, a, a patient can get diagnosed and treated by someone within their own community. Um, so that sort of helps overcome some, some uh, challenges with health care access. Diagnosis is traditionally by microscopy. I mentioned um, this is an image on the left of infected uh, red cells, um, but we uh, the advent of rapid diagnostic tests, which are antigen-based assays, have really revolutionized malaria diagnosis. And now there's over 300 uh, million sold annually. Treatment. Um, we, uh, the standard of care is an artemisinin-based combination therapy for falciparum and uh, resistant Vivax. And this is an image of one. It's usually a three-day therapy. It's very convenient and safe. And then for some um, non-falciparum strains, you're gonna use a different drug, chloroquine and also primaquine uh, to kill that liver stage I mentioned. Uh, next stage, uh, next slide. For prevention, um, we have interventions that target the human and we have interventions that target the mosquito. Um, for the human, um, on a public health level, you can do chemo prevention, which is in high risk areas, you give drugs intermittently to high risk groups like children, pregnant women or infants. And then we now have a new vaccine, the RTSS, which uh, will be interesting to see how it's used. It's only about 30 to 50% um, efficacious uh, and um, that protection is not long lasting. So it, uh, it's not going to be a silver bullet. It's gonna be another tool in the toolbox. And then against the vector, we have insecticide treated bed nets. We spray um, the inside of uh, sleeping structures with an insecticide to repel and kill mosquitoes. That's called IRS under residual spraying. And there's also source control activities like larvicide. Uh, next slide. So why is malaria important? Well, it causes a tremendous burden of disease with hundreds of millions of people um, affected each year. And this burden is mostly experienced by children, especially in Sub-Saharan Af Africa. And this equates to roughly a child dying of malaria um, every two minutes, a child less than five years of age. This is part of uh, why I became interested in malaria as a pediatrician. Um, and the paradox of all this is, uh, is that we have tools to treat, prevent, uh, and eliminate malaria. Next slide. So how have we been doing on malaria elimination worldwide? Well, of 200 countries on earth, there are now 82 that are still endemic. Um, and in the last uh, 20 years, 23 countries have elim eliminated malaria. That's shown in darker blue. So we're on average for the past, since this uh, century, about one country eliminating malaria. And next slide. Uh, oh, you can go to the next slide, yes. Um, so a challenge before us is that we've rolled out all these new interventions, new drugs, diagnostics, um, uh, new vector control tools, but we've really seen a plateau in progress. So this shows the malaria incidence um, globally. And you can see that in the past five years, we've really plateaued in progress. Um, next slide. Mortality seems to continue to decrease, but again, we're starting to see a plateau. And so um, uh, the, the challenge before us is, you know, how we continue to maintain these gains 
but you know how we address these plateaus and you know our group and the consensus from the lancet commission is really that new approaches using existing tools are needed as well as some new new tools um, and we're going to get into some of that go ahead allison Great, thanks, Michelle. Sorry to jump the gun there for a second. <clears throat> All right, so now to the MEI at IGHS. What are we doing about uh, malaria elimination and eradication? So our vision as the MEI is a world free from malaria. This is our group. We're about 35 staff and faculty. Our expertise is in epidemiology, entomology, malariology, advocacy and policy, operational research, public health, and program implementation, evaluation, and management. So since our founding in 2007, we've worked to set the vision, build consensus, and build the evidence base for malaria elimination, and subsequently eradication, and are now really focused on catalyzing district-level impact and translating the elimination and eradication goals into district-level action. Here's a snapshot of where we've worked over the last uh, few years and to date. Um, we, uh, as a small team, don't have a footprint in all of these countries. Instead, we work very closely with ministries of health and with partners to, uh, to implement our work uh, and to build capacity. Our focus areas uh, include uh, five sort of thematic and technical areas ranging from surveillance and response to drugs and diagnostics, vector control and surveillance, program management and leadership, and advocacy, financing, and sustainability. So across these technical areas, we do primarily four things. We do evidence generation range, ranging from uh, systematic literature reviews to uh, clinical trials. We do consensus building and we provide direct technical assistance capacity building to ministries of health and partners. Uh, one critical aspect of our work is that we work across all levels, and this helps maximize the impact of our work and take our evidence into policy. So we work to shape the, the global agenda, we help foster regional collaboration, we inform country implementation, and as I mentioned, we're working increasingly to catalyze district level impact. We won't have much time to get into this, but I will mention that over our years of evidence generation and also working with national malaria programs, we have developed a malaria elimination toolkit for programs and partners uh, with a range of tools that are demand driven, based on evidence, user friendly, and really geared toward problem solving. Um, and these tools are being used uh, around the world by, by ministries uh, and, uh, and partners. And here's a snapshot of our tools, again, ranging uh, on our technical areas from surveillance to, um, to uh, malaria budget advocacy and everything in between. Just a note on our operational model, this is how the MEI functions. Um, we work through partnerships. We focus on solving local problems and are guided by country priorities and questions. We are committed to changing how global health is delivered, ensuring jointly led projects and decision-making. We are committed to developing the next generation of eliminators. And we're working toward a network model where we have formal collaborations and shared staff with local institutions and a one team approach within country partners. So we wanted to dive a little bit more into the problems the MEI is working to solve. Uh, so here, here are the five problems. It was hard to bucket all the work that we do, but here was our attempt uh, to package uh, all of our work into, into the problems we're trying to solve. So I'll let Michelle uh, touch on the first two problems around hidden parasite reservoirs and heterogeneity, uh, heterogeneity of malaria transmission. So uh, a major challenge we have with malaria is very much similar to COVID. Um, I think it's a concept that people understand is uh, reservoirs of transmission. And we refer to this as the hippo's ears. So um, the hippo's ears are infections that are detectable because they're symptomatic and they present for care and because they have a parasite level in the blood that is detectable by standard diagnostics like microscopy and that rapid diagnostic test, the RDT. Uh, that um, uh, we discussed previously. Um, but there's a huge reservoir of undetectable infection. And these are people who uh, have, challenges, have challenges accessing care, even if they're sick, just because of access issues, um, or because they're asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic, so they don't present for care. Um, and then um, also, both symptomatic and asymptomatic infections are often low density and not detectable by standard diagnostics. And this um, graph on the right um, just illustrates this. So something interesting that has been um, 
shown in the past few years is that as transmission declines, so in lower transmission settings that are aiming for elimination, a higher proportion of infections are not detectable by microscopy or RDT. So on the x-axis, you have parasite prevalence by PCR, a molecular test, the most sensitive test. And then on the y-axis, you have the proportion that are detectable by microscopy, or you could also, uh, the, same, it would look, the graph would look the same for RDT. So you can see that as transmission is lower on the left side, a lower proportion of infections are detectable. And um, it, the, the reasons for this are not completely clear, but it looks to be probably that um, if you get malaria and you are not treated, that malaria infection persists for months. Um, and so in a lower transmission setting, a higher proportion of infections are chronic. Um, the other thing that might be contributing to this is that in a lower transmission setting, you have lower genetic diversity. And so people who are infected are more able to develop immunity um, or clinical immunity and maintain these low levels of infections um, when they're not you know, being reinfected, uh, which would might trigger clearance or um, seeking care for that infection. Next slide. So MEI, we've been doing a lot of work around um, novel diagnostic and surveillance tools to uh, find these hidden reservoirs. And I don't have time to go into some of the details, but on the left side, this is an image of an ultra sensitive rapid diagnostic test that we've been evaluating both for its performance to detect individual infections, but also how it performs on a community level to identify hotspots. In the middle, we have an image, this is just a heat block, but um, of sort of more convenient and near point of care methods like LAMP, which is an isothermal amplification method, which has similar um, sensitivity to PCR, but doesn't require you know, a PCR machine and can be done, uh, the results can be available within an hour. We've also been using um, molecular tools to um, not just for detection, but also to um, understand transmission dynamics. So on the right side here, we have here um, a network that we developed using samples collected uh, over a dense, uh, dense sample collection in a um, defined geographical area in Eswatini um, in collaboration with CHAI and the, um, the Clinton Health Access Initiative and the local program there. And we're able to collect both symptomatic and asymptomatic cases. And you can see that we're able to um, demonstrate that most of the infections they have there are, are, are isolated. They don't lead to future chains of transmission, but then a few do. And those are the ones that are connected. And we've done some analyses to try and understand which infections are most likely to lead to future transmission and from where. Um, and then on the bottom right here, I have just an image. We're also looking at serological measures of recent exposure um, to also better uh, characterize transmission, um, but also to use this as a tool to measure impact of interventions, just because infection in and of itself may miss a lot of, um, uh, may, you may miss a lot with just infection data because a lot of people are not infected at that single moment in time that you were making the measurement. So serological tools can be useful in that way. Um, next slide. Another problem is that there's heterogeneity of transmission as transmission declines. So on the left side, you see, you see here that when transmission is higher, you know, larger areas of the community are effective and you can implement a um, single strategy broadly. You know, you aim for 80% coverage of bed nets or 80% coverage or 90% coverage of residual spring. But as transmission declines, the risk is really in certain neighborhoods or even individual homes or people based on their um, activities. They might go into the forest where the vectors are and be more likely to be infected or they travel to a neighboring country that is um, has higher transmission levels and they bring that malaria back. Um, so, uh, you know, 80% of um, malaria transmission is actually seeded by 20% of the people is what's estimated um, by the modelers. And so we're trying to, target that 20%, you know, and not the entire community, um, just because it's more cost effective and uh, effective um, to, to do that. And it becomes an imperative as transmission declines. Uh, next slide. Um, to, uh, we've been doing some work on improving surveillance and response for geographic hotspots. We've done a lot of work around um, active case detection and specifically reactive case detection. 
uh, which is um, another word for contact tracing um, for malaria. So in, uh, once a case is reported, you can uh, go to the home uh, to kind of uh, understand if the case was imported or local and then screen the household members and neighbors. And we've done some studies to evaluate different diagnostics and also um, how you uh, use this information to inform uh, you know, what response is done. You can see in this image here that if we use just rapid diagnostic tests in purple, we didn't detect a lot of hotspots, but if we use LAMP, which is a molecular method, we detected a lot more hotspots. Um, so rapid diagnostic testing in this setting you know, missed a lot of infections. We then went on and conducted, um, have done a lot of trials around alternative approaches. So instead of doing a test and treat, just presumptively treating people with a drug, um, very focally in, this, in these uh, neighborhoods um, with a safe and effective drug, or also just spraying those houses with a highly effective insecticide. And so we recently conducted a cluster randomized control trial in Namibia, which showed that both of these interventions were more effective than the standard of care, which is reactive case detection. Uh, next slide. And we have a new um, uh, Gates funded project to improve surveillance and response uh, in high risk groups. So beyond thinking about geographic hotspots, we're th thinking about you know, individual level risk factors. And this is a busy schematic, but it just shows we've um, developed uh, some tools to support countries in first like identifying who are their high risk populations. Um, and then second, to design strategies that will target those high-risk populations and then uh, implement an intervention and evaluate um, the effectiveness of that intervention. Um, so this is uh, on the right, it just shows um, some of the questions that uh, this work is trying to address is where are these interventions needed? How well are they working? Which diagnostics, which drugs are we gonna use? Um, what vector control interventions? Um, are clusters linked? Um, what's the role of imported malaria? And uh, this scope of work is just beginning um, and we've also linked it up with our molecular surveillance work as well. Um, and right now, Allison, you can jump in. It's, I think we're scaling it up in, in at least five countries now, um, this high risk yeah. population work. All right, and Jenny Smith is leading this work. Um, go ahead, Allison. Great. Great, so problem number three that we're working to solve is around changing vector population dynamics. Um, so what you see here is uh, the vector life and feeding cycle that is, is, is complex, but there are lots of opportunities to exploit vector biology and behavior uh, to prevent uh, transmission and reduce vector populations. Um, unfortunately, to date, um, national malaria programs really only have a couple of tools uh, to use including long-lasting insecticide-treated nets and indoor residual spraying of insecticide inside homes. Um, both of these interventions are targeted at the household. Um, and, and those are the most um, prominent uh, vector control, use, control tools used today. But as you see, there's a lot of missed opportunity to, uh, to exploit vector biology and behavior. Um, but there are a couple of problems. One, uh, the um, you know, research on novel vector control tools is limited. Um, and secondly, um, the, the, the quality and robustness of entomological data that feeds into decision-making about vector control is severely limited due to to, uh, lack of capacity and um, and and other uh, sort of uh, systems gaps in entomological surveillance programs around the world. So the MEI in response to this is working to confront the vector by expanding entomological surveillance programs and capacity, and also doing research on novel vector control tools. So this is a snapshot of our work from Panama. So in Panama, we worked closely with the uh, Ministry of Health there and partners to collect vector data alongside human behavior data. And we were actually able to quantify the, um, the protection, uh, uh, protection yielded by the use of long-lasting insecticide-treated nets, as well as the gaps in protection uh, that require additional supplemental vector control tools. So 
the gridded part of the pie chart, about 54% of transmission is prevented by the use of long lasting insecticide treated nets, but what's in red and blue are the gaps in protection where um, people are, uh, individuals are exposed to uh, potentially infective Anopheles bites. Um, and the majority of that exposure is happening outdoors. Um, and so ultimately that, uh, that means that new tools are needed to, to address these gaps in protection. Um, and we were able to working with the Panama Ministry of Health really expand their, um, their capacity to collect vector data and to use that vector data to drive their, their, their malaria strategy. Um, and this is the type of work we're doing in several countries around the world. Um, and relatedly, we are um, we're working to uh, evaluate novel vector control tools, to expand the toolbox, to uh, bring new tools through uh, through WHO regulatory and policy approvals so that malaria programs have more uh, tools at their fingertips. So this is a systematic literature review we did uh, quite a number of years ago at this point that really demonstrates the lack of evidence, the dearth of evidence on vector control tools beyond nets and, and indoor spraying, um, and, and especially trials, uh, 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 trials that can produce the robust evidence to change policy. There are were, there were very few, a few of those available. Uh, so we are working to uh, evaluate novel vector control tools around the world and several different project sites, and, and in a few minutes I'll have the opportunity to dig into one of those uh, vector control projects that we're, that we're doing in, in Southeast Asia. So problem four that the MEI is working to solve is around operational inefficiencies. Um, so an example of this is, is that the WHO does put out a framework for evaluating programs and the operational inefficiencies in programs to sort of improve malaria control and el elimination. The problem is that it's not really fit for purpose for elimination. It doesn't, um, it doesn't identify the operational gaps and readiness of a system to actually move, of a health system to move towards elimination. Um, and similarly, uh, there are operational efficiencies that, uh, that, that emerge as a result of uh, the discordance of groups working sort of alongside each other, but not with each other. Um, and, uh, and we see this uh, in terms of the, the, the disconnect between some of the work that's happening at the national and policy levels with the programs uh, and the, the disconnect between uh, district health teams and community teams. So our response to this is really to uh, provide tools and capacity building around problem solving. Uh, so one of the tools we've developed is a readiness assessment for malaria elimination that helps to identify operational gaps and um, inform the program as to uh, actions to take to, to, to improve their programs and improve their readiness for elimination. Um, and relatedly, we've developed a framework we call the Leadership and Engagement for Improved Accountability and Delivery of Services Framework, or LEAD, the LEAD framework. Framework, um, that aims to uh, it, it's, um, to improve the the um, the problem solving ability of, of programs at all levels. Uh, this this framework is grounded in organizational development and participatory action research principles, as well as quality improvement methods and principles um, to to bring together the malaria program with district health teams and community teams, among others, uh, through workshops, mentoring, coaching to to really improve program management, leadership of malaria, and problem solve uh, collectively. And finally, the, the last problem we're working to solve is that of domestic financing and financing for malaria elimination in general. So this, uh, this graph is pulled from the latest World Malaria Report um, that shows a, a real leveling off of financing for malaria for malaria control and elimination globally, um, as well as a leveling off of uh, domestic financing from endemic country governments. Those are the pink bars, uh, or the, the, the domestic financing in blue or funding from the global fund and in gold is the USA bilateral funding. So across the board, a real leveling off. And then certainly from endemic countries, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing a plateauing of, of financial commitments for elimination. Um, which against very ambitious elimination and eradic eradication goals is, is, is clearly uh, problematic. Um, and, 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 and relatedly, um, as malaria transmission declines, um, like, it's, like, it, like what's happening in the greater Mekong subregion, as an example, um, it, it risks political commitment and financial commitment from, from local governments as priorities turn to other, uh, other, other health burdens um, away from malaria. Uh, so those are the risks that we're, we're, we're seeing uh, sort of emerge in lower transmission countries. 
So in response, the MEI has developed a sustainability model um, that uh, contains two complementary country level approaches for, for sustainability to, to really build more resilient and sustainable malaria responses for elimination. So the two approaches include malaria donor transitions. So this is uh, work to support country planning and action to transition fully uh, away from donor financing to country financed and managed programs, uh, as well as a complementary approach we call malaria budget advocacy or MBA, which is work to strengthen domestic financing for malaria through subnational leadership and advocacy. So really working at the district level there to improve ownership for elimination and, and um, identify domestic sources of funding. For, for elimination. So with that, uh, that that's a sort of uh, overview of the MEI, the problems we're working to solve. And in our remaining uh, 10 minutes here before we go to our Q&A, um, we wanted to provide two, uh, well, deep dives, not too deep <laughs> though, um, into two projects to give you a better sense of, of some of the work we're doing in country. So first, uh, Michelle will provide a deep dive on some MDA research in Senegal, and then I'll wrap it up with, uh, uh, a deep dive on vector control research in Asia. Michelle, over to you. Sure. Um, so uh, we have, uh, with USAID funding, we are currently collaborating with the University of TS, with the local program, CDC and Presence Malaria Initiative, um, and also uh, UCAD, another university in Senegal, on a mass drug administration trial. Um, and we were fortunately able to make it out there, uh, some of us last month, um, for some of the field activities and some meetings. Um, next slide. So um, why, uh, why did we do this trial? Well, we've, our group has had a lot of experience with um, reactive focal mass drug administration. I mentioned this in very low transmission settings. Um, but there's interest now in using mass drug administration, not just in the very low transmission settings, but for a country that has, where progress has plateaued, where it's a moderate, previously moderate high transmission, and now they've come down to moderate low levels of transmission, can't seem to get to pre-elimination levels. And Senegal is one such country. Um, well, you know, they've, uh, they've gotten to this, this is a map on the top that shows um, prevalence, and on the bottom it shows incidence. And in the northern areas, they have gotten down to pre-elimination -elim levels, but in the su southern areas, you know, there's still moderate transmission uh, levels of transmission. So can MDA be used to bring the entire country to a pre-elimination state um, and help them reach their goal for elimination? Um, so this trial was um, supported through um, USAID PMI headquarters because it was felt to be something that would generate evidence for all of their PMI countries. Um, they have almost 30 countries that, are, that they support. And in this setting, they've already have strong case management. They're already doing um, seasonal malaria chemo prevention to children. They already have community health workers in place and they're already, um, you know, have good coverage of bed nets. Um, next slide. So some modeling suggested that MDA would help get uh, this area at Tambacounda, the Southern part of Senegal to pre-elimination levels. Um, the dotted line just shows malaria transmission with the seasons. The pink shows sort of um, what transmission is with different types of SMC, which is one of their current standards and, and bed nets and other interventions. And this blue, the blue lines show where they would get with, with MDA. Um, and so that was some of the preliminary data that led to the work. Next slide. So to evaluate this intervention, we're, we're conducting a pragmatic open label cluster randomized control trial. We have 60 villages um, in the catchment area of seven health facilities that we're randomizing, to, that we've randomized to MDA to an entire village using an ACT, artemisinin combination therapy, plus a single low dose of primaquine, which um, our group has done a lot of work on to show uh, decreases transmission because it targets that gametocyte site, the sexual stage of uh, malaria. We're doing it through directly observed therapy because that's how they currently do their um, seasonal malaria chemo prevention to children. And um, in the control arm, they're getting SMC to young children, to children three months to 10 years of age. Uh, and it's being conducted over a one year period. Next slide. This just shows a map of the where the 60 villages are and the seven health posts. 
and we've got a buffer zone around each village to deal with potential contamination. And we the study was powered in order to bring down the incidents um, down to a level of five per 1,000, which we feel uh, is, is what, when this region would be ready to transition to um, you know, pre-elimination, elimination strategy. Uh, next slide. This just shows um, the timeline for this project. We started off with a baseline survey um, and mapping of the study area, um, randomization into the two arms. Uh, and then there's one year of follow-up where we're gonna be looking at its impact um, even after we stop the intervention. We did a survey before and after um, the MDA periods, or actually the post-MDA survey is happening next month. Um, and just to get to one of the questions I see in the chat box, um, Eric Gooseby is just asking, how do you measure the impact with such large reservoirs of disease, both symptomatic and asymptomatic, obscuring your denominator? And I think this um, example just sort of shows uh, different ways we can assess that. So incidence will be our primary outcome. That's symptomatic malaria presenting to health facilities. Um, and that is a measure that's been shown to uh, correlate with other measures of transmission, um, like um, uh, the, you know, the, the real gold standard of transmission is something called, we call an entomological inoculation rate, which is the number of infected, um, number of bites someone gets from an mis infected mosquito, either yearly or um, monthly. And uh, that's literally done by people sitting out catching mosquitoes and then they check if they're infected. But that type of a measure, measurement is too hard to do in a very, in a lower transmission setting, even a moderate transmission setting, it's hard to look at that outcome. So incidence has been shown to correlate that, but correlate with that, but you will miss symptomatic cases. So we are also looking at prevalence of infection um, through a cross-sectional survey. And then we're also looking at serological markers of re recent exposure. So I mentioned that we're, we're, we've, um, we just recently had a paper accepted uh, where um, serological measures have been used for the first time in a cluster randomized control trial to look at the impact of the intervention. So we're gonna be using some of those similar methods um, in this trial. And next slide. Um, the uh, delivery and coverage has been excellent and um, partly because, or mainly because this is being, there's, this community engagement is so strong and the level of engagement of um, the health system at all levels has been very strong. Um, we have not hired you know, extra staff for this. This is being implemented through community health workers, uh, 241 community health workers and 57 local supervisors because they already have the infrastructure in place for their seasonal malaria chemo prevention. So this is three rounds, like I mentioned, each round has three days. The left side shows round one and the, this one um, the, on the right shows round two. And the colors, red is just less than 50% coverage, yellow is 50 to uh, 80, and then green is above 80. So you can see with round one, we were more in the yellow range, but with round two, we were able to improve uh, to get everybody into the green range. Next slide. We haven't had any severe adverse events we have had some mild and moderate side effects, um, and uh, we've been monitoring that through active and passive pharmacovigilance. Um, obviously, we would find a few more, find more adverse effects with the active pharmacovigilance, but again, they've all been mild and moderate side effects. <clears throat> Next step, slide. So for this um, study, you know, we have our endline survey coming up. We're going to be doing the lab work. Uh, we hope to get the May, the initial, the first year results out next year, and then the subsequent um, paper and dissemination piece with the second year of follow-up. Um, we're also doing some qualitative studies of acceptability um, and quantitative as well. And we're also doing uh, cost-effectiveness analysis and this um, with a, a local health, health economist at University of TS. And our anticipated impact is that uh, this project will generate some new evidence regarding uh, the use of MDA to accelerate toward pre-elimination. And I don't have time to get into um, other future work, but there's a lot of additional um, questions that, uh, you know, we can pursue in future work related to the operational and technical aspects of MDA, particularly with regards to relevance for um, other settings. Um, I'm going to pass off to Allison.
Thanks, Michelle. Um, and I, we're just about at time. We want to leave, we want to leave questions, uh, time for questions, excuse me. So I'll just whip through this um, just to say that in addition to our research on drug-based interventions, we are looking at um, research on, on vector control interventions um, and to bring new vector control tools into the market for malaria programs. Um, so this research project takes place in Southeast Asia, <clears throat> targeting um, uh, high-risk groups there that are exposed to uh, malaria in forest settings uh, because of their occupation or where they live. Um, we're evaluating a number of uh, novel vector control products, including passive and active spatial repellents that essentially provide a bubble of protection around individuals. We're looking at novel insecticide-treated clothing um, and a topical repellent. While that's not novel, we're looking at it in, in a package of interventions. Um, and we're, we're doing this work through several phases of research, um, most in, mostly in the field in Cambodia with partners there. And we do have some semi-field studies going on in, in Thailand as well. Um, here's a snapshot of some of our semi-field work. So this is our ability to evaluate a product in a very tightly controlled environment where we can uh, release and recapture mosquitoes and uh, really uh, sort of confidently evaluate the efficacy of products uh, versus in a field setting with wild populations of vectors, you release a lot of uh, control. I won't go through this given time, but uh, looking at several interesting outcomes uh, in the semi-field study. In the field, we're doing several user acceptability studies to get, uh, get feedback from potential users on the different tools. We're doing an um, uh, entomological study right now, actually, um, in the field using a Latin, squ Latin square design to look at the entomological impact of these tools on, on wild populations of mosquitoes, as well as collecting user experience data. And here's just a snapshot from the field in Cambodia. Those tents are where we're, you know, the, the guys collect mosquitoes underneath those tents and here's one of our field collectors doing a human landing catch. Uh, I think this is during a training um, to, to, to capture a mosquitoes and that's how we evaluate the efficacy and effectiveness of the, uh, of the products themselves. Um, we'll be doing a prevalence survey starting in a, actually a couple of days to get baseline uh, prevalence among our high-risk populations and then we'll start a randomized cluster randomized control trial in a few months to evaluate the effectiveness of these products uh, on malaria incidents and in in individuals exposed to malaria in forest settings compared to standard of care uh, and have a bunch of other outcomes too that we're looking at. So we'll end there. We will end there. Um, here's a link to our website. If you're interested in learning more about us, you're always welcome to reach out to Michelle and me too with any questions. Oh, let me see if I can get out of my screen sharing. Um, Let's see here if I can do that. Otherwise, um, we appreciate, um, we appreciate, here we go, I can't multitask. Yeah, we appreciate the opportunity to present to everyone and uh, look forward to your, to your questions. I see a couple already in Q&A, but we'll turn it over to, uh, to Lake uh, to, to facilitate this part. So thanks very much. Hello. Hi, Allison. Hi, Michelle. Thank you all so much for um, that talk. That was very informative. And um, yes, we do have um, a couple of questions in the chat. Um, feel free to ask more if y'all would like. Um, I just want to start off with um, finishing one of uh, Eric's questions. Um, he had also asked, um, are you able to show an additive impact on elimination with vector control interventions that are implemented concurrently? And um, I think yeah, um, thank you. Michelle, do you want to take that for your trial? Yeah, that's a yeah. great question. And it's not usually studied because it's hard to um, look at combinations of interventions. But we, in our Namibia trial, uh, which is published in The Lancet, we use a two by two factorial design where we were able to evaluate those drug based and vector control interventions independently and in combination. And we did see an additive effect. Um, and we also saw a synergistic effect, actually, because you can look at interaction with that study design. Um, but uh, it, it was a big trial, and I don't know that it's feasible to take that approach to evaluate all interventions. Um, I think that there's um, a lot of work to be done to understand how we can evaluate combinations of interventions, because we have so many new tools available now. We're going to have new vector control tools, new vaccines new vaccines beyond the current vaccines. And it's not gonna be possible to do trials on every different 
combination and permutations of those combinations. So um, uh, some of that work's gonna you know, require new methods, I think in mathematical modeling, but also in um, like just understanding the transportability of findings. Uh, we have another question um, as well uh, with Yasmin. Um, they would like to know um, how how MEI uh, functions. Um, do you approach a country or partner first, or is it the partner approaches you? And uh, in a little bit of addition to that question, I would like to know, know if you could give an example of um, a successful partnership um, with a country. Great questions. Yeah, thanks, Like, um, And hi, Yasmin. <laughs> it's nice to, nice to see you after, I think it's been many years. Uh, nice to see your name, that is. Um, so thanks for the question. Um, uh, so we, uh, so I would say it goes both ways. So sometimes partners or programs uh, will approach us and this happens often in sort of regional forum or um, when we're visiting countries um, or the other way around. Like we may, we may sort of reach out to, to countries um, to understand sort of their needs, their gaps and see if we can uh, support um, in any way. So, and, and like to get some specificity there, I think we, you know, we have, um, yeah, some really, we're really grateful. We, we have some really great partnerships with ministries of health and with partners. And like I mentioned earlier on in the presentation, this is how we do our work. This is how we maximize impact. You know, we're 30 people and uh, we, we really rely on that sort of one team approach with ministries of health and countries to do any of our work. Uh, so examples. Um, well, uh, so yeah, top of mind is, uh, there's a, a several, uh, Panama, you know, I spoke about uh, our Panama entomological work there. We have um, a, a really nice partnership with the uh, Ministry of Health, with MINSA, and with the Clinton Health Access Initiative to, um, to scale up entomological surveillance in country. Another country where we've had longstanding work since uh, back to probably 2008 uh, is, is Namibia, where we've collaborated very closely with the Ministry of Health and Social Services there and the University of Namibia. Um, to run uh, a bunch of research projects, do a lot of programmatic work together. We've done a lot of capacity building work there, um, mentorship, uh, and, uh, and so that's another country where, where we have longstanding collaborations. Uh, what would you say makes a successful um, partnership or in the, another side of the coin, an, a non-successful partnership? Um, yeah, sure. Well, I'll take a swing. And then Michelle, if you want to jump in, uh, I would say, um, you know, we, um, firstly, we, we, we work to answer the country's questions and help to solve their problems. So I think that's the, the foundation to the partnership is that we're not here with our own agenda. You know, we're working um, to help solve what's, you know, what their problems are. Um, I think, you know, we build trust uh, uh, based on, you know, our, the way we sort of partner, the way we're uh, open and collaborative. And I would say also that, you know, partners trust us because of the quality and the rigor of our work. And we take that very seriously. Um, so that would be a, a couple of my, um, my, my sort of gut reactions to your questions. Michelle, do you wanna jump in with anything? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, I mean, there's a whole range of different partnerships we've had. I think the the ones where we have sort of a long-term working relationship seem to work well, but I think we also have, you know, one-off projects based on a very specific question. Um, and we've also had partnerships where we were working very closely, but then we weren't needed anymore. And that's fine. And that's something to embrace because it's good. Um, you know, we... Allison didn't talk about this, but we helped uh, catalyze two regional networks, uh, one called the Asia Pacific Malaria Elimination Network, and another called the Elimination Eight in Southern Africa. And we are um, just a partner now in those regional networks because uh, the secretariats have been transferred over to local groups. Uh, they've been able to identify sustained funding for those projects. Um, and so in some ways, where we are able to catalyze something, um, and it, it, you know, it's it's being run locally is 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 good. <laughs> so, um, I think there's a lot of way, different ways to answer that question. 
Um, thank you. Uh, I now for the hot button topics. Um, there's many questions around surrounding COVID 19's impact, um, especially on um, the malaria elimination initiatives work, um, its impact on multiple aspects of healthcare. Um, and so this question is by Alistair, um, and they want to know what impact can we expect the COVID 19 pandemic to have on global malaria elimination efforts? And furthermore, do you expect to see an uptake in malaria cases and deaths in the coming years? I can Thanks, say mm -hmm. a, 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 an early stab at that. I think Eric asked that too, is um, did COVID displace funding opportunities for your program portfolio? And um, it hasn't uh, displaced funding opportunities just because for, for our group specifically, just because malaria is still such a, causes such an enormous burden of disease. And that's recognized by um, uh, important funding, you know, large funding agencies. So I think, um, you know, funding for our activities has, I, I haven't felt it at least immediately. Um, I think that uh, there was a lot of work done early on by the WHO and other partners to really bring attention to malaria that we can't um, lose our eye on malaria because you know diverting attention away from it could be quite detrimental. Um, there were estimates that malaria caseloads would um, double or more during the period of COVID and that hasn't happened, at least globally. There are several potential reasons. One is that surveillance hasn't been good. Um, and so we're just uh, not, picking up on those cases. Uh, but another, but it, from my experience, from the countries where we've worked, um, it, in malaria cases haven't resurged. And a lot of that I think has to do with the fact that um, there's le there was less movement of people um, in some places. And so that helped keep malaria down, particularly in some areas where movement of people really contributes to transmission. Another thing that is that places really affected by malaria, like. I mean, there is urban malaria, but a lot of most malaria is rural. And in rural areas, people uh, are at lower risk for COVID, I think, because of, you know, they're spending so much of their time outdoors um, that we haven't seen as much of an uptick in COVID cases uh, in their rural areas of, as you have in urban areas. And then in those rural areas, there's, um, because there's, uh, you know, malaria has been such a longstanding problem, you know, they're, there's been commitment to, to, to it. I, 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 obviously, there's programs have been disrupted, but um, I think because of all the advocacy up front, it hasn't been as affected as many of us feared it would be. It, it obviously is still a challenge, um, but I, I haven't, uh, it's not something that I think is, is, it, it is something that um, we don't need to worry about. It's something we need to continue to advocate and be aware of. Um, Allison, maybe you have more to add. Uh, I didn't mean to paint a rosy picture, but just to say that I think it hasn't been as bad as many of us feared. Well, and I'll just add on with a little doom and gloom, which is that, you know, the COVID epidemic is still, um, you know, raging in most of these, uh, you know, countries in the world that are endemic for malaria. So, um, you know, and, and limited vaccine access and such. So, uh, I think also time will tell. Um, I think there's ongoing advocacy, ongoing work on the supply chain to keep commodities flowing um, and, uh, and trying to improve surveillance and these other aspects Michelle mentioned. But um, I, think, um, I think we'll see, you know, once uh, the, world, the next World from Malaria report is supposed to come out in a couple of weeks time or months time. So I think that will be telling as to where we're at. Well, uh, we're at the witching hour here and uh, Lake, terrific job. Allison and Michelle, thank you very much. Um, this has been a great discussion. I've, I, I've learned a lot. Um, and what I just remind people that our next uh, IGHS Grand Rounds will be on December 8th at noon when Monica Gandhi will discuss all things COVID vaccine that you don't know, which is, means she'll discuss all the vaccines except Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson and Johnson. So the Sinovax, the Sinopharms, the AstraZenecas, the Sputnik Vs, all these other ones that are kind of swirling around the edges, which will be very important for global health because those are the ones that are probably gonna get distributed. So anyway, we'll thank you again very much and we look forward to seeing you back on December the 8th. Take care, bye-bye. <laughs>